Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of Prehistory in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons and our channel members over at our sister channel, History in the Dark. You are the reason why this content remains underground. And today, we're going to discuss fossils. Yep. I know there's only a handful of you that follow me over here. Our subscriber count isn't exactly high, especially when compared to History in the Dark. But I have a few of you that continue to want this kind of content. And you guys mentioned last week that you wanted me to discuss all the different kinds of fossils. As I alluded to then, fossil is actually kind of a vague term. And, you know, there's a lot to go over. So I figured why not give a brief overly simplified explanation on what fossils are and how they form. This is not a story, just an explanation of fossils. So if you follow paleontology, you probably know that fossils are a thing that exist. And given they form the basis of paleontology, that uh, is understandable. The reason paleontology is even a field is because fossils are things that do happen. The word fossil is actually from classical Latin, fossilis, which means obtained by digging. Yeah, that's pretty on the nose. And the definition of a fossil is any preserved remains, impression, or trace of any once living thing from a past geological age. Now that you've heard that definition, you probably realize now how vague that really is. But because fossils do exist, we are able to get brief windows into past life on this planet. But you need to understand, seriously, how unusual it is for something to fossilize. Because some people assume that a process like mummification is a form of fossilization. It ain't. They are not the same thing, at all. Mummification does not preserve things for nearly as long as a fossil would. Now, it is possible to find fossils that showed evidence of once being naturally mummified, but mummification is an entirely different method of preserving something, and most mummification as we understand it is actually done through completely unnatural means, as in humans did it on purpose. It does happen naturally on occasion, but it's pretty rare. But then again, so are fossils. To emphasize how rare fossils are, consider this. Tyrannosaurus rex is one of the most consistently and well-studied dinosaurs ever. It's one of the most famous, and pretty much everybody, even non-dinosaur fans, knows what a T-Rex is. At least the general idea. A big honkin' chungus that's gonna eat ya! Now, so far, we have discovered about 32 adult T-Rex specimens. That sounds like a pretty high amount of fossils, especially for such a large creature, and yeah, that's actually pretty good by fossil standards, that the T-Rex existed as a species for an exceedingly long amount of time, like a little less than 15 million years. Then consider how many generations of Tyrannosaurs would have existed. Researchers have actually estimated this, and they concluded that over that time, 2.5 billion individual T-Rex would have been born and existed on this planet. Out of 2.5 billion, only 32 have ever been discovered as fossils. Now, it's true, there might be a few more still in the ground somewhere that we just haven't found, that's possible, but even so, the difference in the amount of T-Rexes and the amount of fossilized remains of T-Rexes is multiple orders of magnitude. It isn't even close. And that's the case with everything. Fossils only form under very, very, very specific situations. And if those situations don't happen to any of the remains at any point, they will, in fact, disappear entirely, turn to dust. And you must consider that part of the reason we know so much about something like a Tyrannosaur is that they were an insanely successful species, as were pretty much any species we found fossils of. If a species lasted long enough to have at least one individual be fossilized, it means that they were probably pretty prevalent and existed for quite a long time. Consider how many species that weren't as successful maybe only existed for a few thousand years, 
that never had their remains fossilized at all. There are probably billions of species over the course of Earth's history that we don't know about and will never know about. We may never know they ever existed because they simply didn't exist long enough for their remains to be left behind for us to locate. But I digress. You're here for the different types of fossils. Well, let's talk about the different processes of how things can be fossilized. The processes tend to vary generally based on tissue type as well as external conditions, but there are a few different methods for accomplishing some level of fossilization. The first is permineralization. This is a process of fossilization that occurs when an organism is buried. The empty spaces within that creature that would normally be filled with liquid or gas while they were alive become filled with mineral-rich groundwater. The minerals precipitate from the groundwater and occupy the empty space. This process can occur in very small spaces too, like within the cell wall of a plant cell. Small-scale permineralization can produce very, very, very detailed fossils that are excellent for study. But for this to actually occur at all, the organism has to be covered by sediment very soon after it died. Otherwise, the remains are easily destroyed very quickly by scavengers or just flat-out decomposition. The degree to which the remains are decayed when covered determines the later details of the fossil. That's the reason why some fossils only contain skeletal remains or teeth, because those parts of the animal last much longer than the soft tissue does. Permineralization is actually generally what people think of when they think of a fossil. Because generally when you hear the word fossil, you think of dinosaur bones. And yes, most of the dinosaur bones that we find are permineralized, as are things like petrified wood. But there are other methods for fossilization, such as casts and molds. Now, you hear that, and you probably say, wait, don't paleontologists do that to some bones because they're too fragile to display otherwise? And yeah, that's true. Some displays in museums aren't the actual bones because yes, they are too fragile to display. Often a cast is made instead due to the need to preserve the actual specimen. But this can happen naturally too. In some cases, the original remains of the organism are completely destroyed, but they leave behind a shaped hole in the rock that's referred to as an external mold. If that void is later filled with sediment, the resulting cast resembles what the organism actually looked like, and that can be used to study the organism. An endocast or internal mold is also possible, and that's the result of sediments filling an organism's interior. If they harden, we can get a sense of what the inside of the organism looked like, but it's a little more rare. Then there's orthogenic mineralization. That's a special form of cast and mold formation. What happens is, if the chemistry is right, and by right I mean extremely specific, the organism, or a fragment of it, can act as a nucleus for the precipitation of minerals such as siderite, resulting in a nodule forming around it. If that happens rapidly before any significant decay occurs, very fine three-dimensional morphological detail can be preserved. Then there's replacement and recrystallization. This occurs when the shell, bone, or other tissue is replaced entirely with another mineral. In some cases, mineral replacement of the original shell occurs so gradually over time, and at such fine scales, that microstructural features are preserved despite the fact that the original material is effectively gone, it's not even there, but it's replaced so slowly and specifically that it really might as well be. Then there's adpression, like those of ferns, are the result of a chemical reduction of the complex organic molecules composing the organism's tissues. What that means is that the fossil actually consists of original material, but in a geochemically altered state. Often what remains is a carbonaceous film, known as a phytoleme, in which case the fossil is known as a compression. However, often the phytoleme is lost entirely, and all that remains is an impression of the organism in the rock, which is known as an impression fossil. Compressions and impressions tend to occur together, and can be found together. The phytoleme will often be attached to one part of the rock, while the impression will be on the other. 
Then there's soft tissue cell and molecular preservation. This is very unusual, but it does happen. For a long time, it was actually thought that soft tissue wasn't preserved at all. But in 2014, Mary Schweitzer and her colleagues reported the presence of iron particles associated with soft tissues recovered from dinosaur fossils based on various experiments that studied the interaction of iron in hemoglobin with blood vessel tissue. They proposed that solution hypoxia coupled with iron chelation enhances the stability and preservation of soft tissue and provides the basis for an explanation for the unforeseen preservation of fossil soft tissues. An earlier study also focused on collagen, which is bound to be preserved in some fossils, and that the quality of that preservation depended mostly on the arrangement of the collagen fibers, with tight packing favoring good preservation. Moving forward, there's also carbonization and colification. Fossils that are carbonized, or colified, consist of the organic remains, but they have been reduced primarily to the chemical element carbon. Carbonized fossils consist of a thin film, which forms a silhouette of the original organism, and the original organic remains were typically soft tissues. Colified fossils exist primarily of coal. Yes, really, actual coal. It's a fossil fuel. But you think that name wasn't literal? And the original organic remains were typically woody in composition. And the last main type of preservation involves bioimmeration. Bioimmeration occurs when a skeletal organism overgrows or otherwise subsumes another organism. This is a really weird one if you can guess. The latter winds up being preserved, or at least an impression of it, within the skeleton of the larger organism. Yeah, it's weird, and I know I've been throwing a lot of big words at you, and I am so sorry for that. But now you at least have a rough idea of how things become fossils, but there are different types of fossils too. First, there are index fossils. Index fossils, that are sometimes called guide fossils, indicator fossils, or zone fossils, are fossils that are used to define and identify geological periods. These are very important, because although the sediments in the ground may look different, depending on the conditions under which they were deposited, they may actually include remains of the same exact species. As a result, it's easy to tell what geological age they're dealing with whenever they're looking at these layers, even if the sediments themselves are kind of different. And by cross-referencing the sediments and the species that still existed when they were laid out, it can give scientists a much better picture of what that era actually looked like. The best index fossils are common, by fossil standards, and easy to identify at species level. Then there are trace fossils. These include things like tracks and burrows. Trace fossils are generally signs that an organism once existed, but not actually remains of the organism itself. But they are still very significant because they represent data sources that are limited not just to the animals. They, in fact, reflect the animal's actual behaviors which is something that just looking at the remains of the animal, especially just bones, is a lot more difficult to tell. But trace fossils show how the animals actually behaved in some aspects, and that can help piece together their, you know, general habits and temperament, at least to a small degree. Then there's transitional fossils. Boy, howdy do creationists love bringing this one up. A transitional fossil is any fossilized remains of a life form that exhibits traits common to both an ancestral group and its derived descendant group. They're very important for showing evolution. And yes, transitional fossils have been discovered. Quite a lot of them, in fact. Stop saying they haven't. You're lying. There's microfossils, which is a descriptive term applied to fossilized plants and animals whose size is just at or below the level at which the fossil can be analyzed by the naked eye. They're very, very small fossils, but they are extremely important as a reservoir for paleoclimate information, and they are also commonly used by biostenographers to assist in the correlation of rock units. Then there's resin, or amber. Amber is amazing. It's a natural polymer that's found in many different types of strata throughout the world. The oldest fossil resin actually dates back to the Triassic period, though most can be found in the Cenozoic. 
the excretion of sap by certain plants is thought to be an evolutionary adaptation for protection from insects and to seal wounds. Trees nowadays still do this, and over time the sap actually hardens into, well, amber. The amber itself actually counts as a fossil since it is organic in nature, but it often contains other fossils that are known as inclusions that were captured by the sap when it was still a liquid. These remains can include bacteria, fungi, other plants, and animals, usually small invertebrates like insects and spiders. Amber is a great tool for getting a window into what early insects looked like because it preserves things extremely well. It's pretty rare for anything bigger than an insect to be caught by amber though, since obviously there was never some kind of great flood of amber or something, though if we ever do find a tyrannosaur locked in amber, I will absolutely freak out. That's not going to happen though. It's not impossible for amber to be discovered containing something like a small lizard, but that's about as large as it gets. And Michael Crichton used amber as the basis for how they got dinosaur DNA. They simply analyzed the preserved blood out of blood-sucking insects that were stuck inside the amber and got DNA from dinosaurs. In reality, this is not a foolproof method for accomplishing this, as DNA itself doesn't last millions of years. It breaks down. The oldest DNA that's ever been found is something like 80,000 years old, which is definitely on the long end for DNA, but we've never found DNA that's lasted longer than that. So while it's theoretically not impossible to get DNA from, say, large prehistoric mammals from amber, getting dinosaur DNA from it is probably not going to happen. Though I can make another entire video about what we need to do in order to actually clone a dinosaur. That's a long list of things we actually need to accomplish in order to do that. Then there's derived or reworked fossils. These are fossils found in rock that accumulated significantly later than when the fossilized animal or plant died. They are created by erosion exhuming, freeing fossils from the rock formation in which they were originally deposited and their redeposition in a younger sedimentary deposit. They are very very confusing fossils for paleontologists, and it's important to know when these exist. Then there's just wood. Fossil wood is a special type of fossil on its own, and it's wood that's preserved. That's, that's, that's exactly what it is. Because of wood's nature as a strong material, it's the part that's more likely to be preserved, and it may or may not be petrified. And then there's subfossils. Subfossils are a little weird because they're used to refer to remains, like bones, whose fossilization process isn't actually done yet. Either because the animal itself died too recently, which, by the way, fossilization takes at least 10,000 years to accomplish, so anything within that time frame usually won't be a full fossil, or because the conditions in which the remains were buried were not optimal for fossilization. Some fossils are often found in caves, and like I said, within the last 10,000 years, if you find remains from any animal during that time, they probably aren't a full fossil at that point, as the process just couldn't be finished. But at the same time, their remains are still there to look at, so they're still useful to paleontologists. And there's also, finally, chemical fossils. Chemical fossils, or just chemofossils, are chemicals that are found in rocks and fossil fuels that provide an organic signature of ancient life. Molecular fossils and isotope ratios represent two types of chemical fossils. The oldest trace of life on Earth are fossils of this type, since back then all life was single-celled. But we can look at chemical fossils to see that there were life forms on this planet as early as 4.1 billion years ago. There was a lot to unpack with fossils, and I did give you the oversimplified version here. This doesn't even scratch the surface of the complexity of fossils and how remains can be preserved over time. But the point is, they form the quite literal backbone of paleontology as a whole. We can't look at the past without having some evidence that it happened, that things were there, and fossils allow us to see that. So I guess it's a good thing that this process happens at all. However rare it may be, we do find them. And when we do, we get more info about where we come from and the history of our own planet.
Till next time, this is Darkness and a bit well of fond farewell.